Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the most self-aware of all? Yeah, welcome, lecture three. Uh, th this is lecture three, chapter six, I should say. This is a lecture I've been looking forward to giving you a little bit. I alluded to it earlier. Um, it... It, it changed my life. Uh, the, the thing, what I'm going to tell you about right now, you know, you guys have seen some of the results of it. Um, but what I'm going to tell you about was really the beginning, I think, of me thinking about my stance on, on animal research. Um, and so the story goes back a bit, and I look forward to telling you the story and, and provoking your minds a little bit. So let's, let's hop into it. it we're really going to focus on self-awareness. And, you know, we, we often look at ourselves in mirrors. So mirrors are going to play an important role. That reflection gives us information about ourselves. Um, and, you know, very often when we're looking in the mirror, we are looking at ourselves and thinking about ourself um, in, in some way. And when you really think about it, mirrors are not really very natural. And what I mean by that is they don't really occur in nature. The closest they occur in nature is like the flat surface of a, of a body of water. So if you think of animals in nature, most animals don't see their reflection. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing that we do and that we maybe consult mirrors or photographs of ourselves or things like that as much as we do. So this is all going to... Uh, kind of inform an experimental approach I'm going to tell you about here. And I want to give you a little bit of a background. So I'm just going to jump to, to here for a second. Uh, you guys know I'm a big fan of critical thought uh, and trying to enhance your critical thought. Critical thought is huge in the scientific process. Um, and in fact, you know, it's really in graduate school, I think, when I really started to appreciate the role that critical thought plays in science. Part of that I want to tell you about is the peer review of articles. You guys are now um, in a step in your peer scholar activity where you are giving feedback to your peers. What you are going through is exactly what every scientist goes through uh, when they want to publish a paper. That is, they begin by writing a paper, just like in your create phase. They submit it to a journal. That journal then sends it out to three or more other experts in your field, whatever your field may be, um, those are your peers. Those peers each look at your work and you know, occasionally you're asked to be a reviewer. That's kind of the experience you have in the assess phase. You are actually acting as the reviewer. Um, but when you submit a paper, of course, other people review your paper. Uh, and when they review your paper, to some extent, they are looking for reasons why your paper does not deserve to be published. It's kind of the mindset we have. We're looking for flaws. We're looking at, did they design the experiment right? Are there confounds we have to worry about? The way they, um, the way they define their variables, their operational definitions that they used for the independent and the dependent variable, does that make sense? Does it map up to their, their theory and their hypothesis right? Uh, and so we look through the study very, very carefully. Were there enough subjects? Can we actually trust the, the results? And if we find anything that looks suspect, then we flag that to an editor. We say, I don't know, I don't really like this, and I don't know about that. And so the editor gets these reviews from three people who've basically tried to find the problems with a paper, and the editor makes a decision on that basis about whether they want to publish that paper or not. Um, and then there's really a third option. There's publish, there's not, or there's send it back to the original person and say, you need to change, you need to fix a bunch of stuff. Now you can't fix your experiment once your experiment's done, but sometimes it's about what you've said about the experiment or, or maybe papers you should have talked about that you missed, uh, etc. Uh, and so you have to do some revision of the work. Sometimes you actually have to collect more data. Sometimes the editor will say, we need another experiment in this paper if you want it to be published. And so you get that from the, from the editor. You have to think through all those reviews as you will do in the reflect phase, and you have to revise your paper to make it better. So, you know, very important. And one of the places we learn to tear apart other people's research 
is in graduate school. Um, a big part of graduate school, the, the learning process is very different, at least in, in the sciences. You know, rather than just taking courses where we walk you through lectures or whatever, instead, at least what we did in graduate school is we would take somebody's paper, published paper. Somebody would present that paper and all of us in the class would try to rip it apart. We'd try to find everything that was wrong with it. And that's how we actually impressed the faculty. <laughs> so I went to University of Waterloo and, and they were very much like this. The faculty were impressed if you could find all the problems with something else. Because if you can find them in the work of others, you're probably not going to do them in your own work, right? If you, if you get sensitive and aware of all these potential ways a paper can be bad, then those are all things you can avoid while you're doing research. So they, they loved it when we were ferocious <laughs> to some extent when when we would really try to find flaws and stuff and they taught us to do that they taught us to kind of take this critical approach to everything we did um, and there was another place where this really played out uh, and you know almost to the pride of of these faculty members and that is during academic talks so we would invite people to come and present their research um, this is done all over the place. It's done at U of T. We have people come in and present their research. Often it's sort of cordial and there isn't much what I call sparring, but sometimes there's a lot of sparring. And, and what I mean by sparring is it's two academics, you know, debating their positions about something. And um, this is, you know, critical thought is huge because you have to have a justification if you want to attack someone's position and, and suggest an alternate. You have to have some reason, some backing to do that. And so often these talks turn into these academic sparring sessions. Um, and at Waterloo, that was really the case. In fact, as horrible as this sounds, at Waterloo, they would love nothing more than for an imminent speaker to come and talk about the research only to be, I'll use the word humiliated, but most imminent researchers are never humiliated, um, but, but only to be, you know, roundly at, uh, attacked as a uh, a strong word, but confronted by the graduate students of, of that program, you know, coming at them and saying, but why did you do that? Couldn't it be this and whatever? So, you know, they took great pride in, in those of us, our, their graduate students, showing this critical thinking uh, in, in the sort of academic sparring. Okay. So this happens all the time. Science is about arguing, um, but it's about arguing in justified ways, and that requires critical thought. And the idea is that this arguing will help us weed out bad ideas um, and, and leave us, therefore, with, with ideas that stand up to, to the arguing. And so it's seen as very critical. Critical thought is really critical to that process of science of getting at the truth. Okay, so another hit of critical thought and why you want to learn it, why it's so important. Now let me take all this and tell you the story. Let's go back to self-awareness. So while I was a student in Waterloo, um, I, I, I recall somebody coming in front of all of us. We had a class and they came in front and they said, uh, guess what class? We have a really interesting guest speaker next week. It's a guy named Gordon Gallup Jr. Um, and he is going to come and talk to our group about his scientific investigations of self-awareness. We were giddy with excitement because if there was one thing we didn't think you could study scientifically, it was self-awareness. Um, it really felt like that is a fluffy, fluffy topic. Uh, and it's, you know, come up in the chapter where we're saying awareness of self is, is one aspect of consciousness. Uh, and so we were licking our lips, sharpening our knives, as it were. This Gordon Gallup guy, he was going to walk in and we were just going to show him why his experiments said nothing about anything. Okay. Um, and then he came in and he kind of floored us. He certainly floored me. Um, he, he had a very elegant approach that left me, what well, changed me again. I'll just say it that way again, change me. So let me tell you the story the way Gordon tells it. He says, um, as a young student, he was shaving in the mirror one day and he was, um, trying to think, what should I, what should I do? Um, I don't have this quite right. He had a PhD student, so I have this a little wrong. Oh, wow. 
it doesn't matter. And so he was trying to think, what, what would be a good project for that student? So it wasn't the student himself. It was Gordon Gallup that was thinking this. I'm sorry, I got the story a little wrong. But he was shaving and thinking, what would be a good project for And then as he was shaving, he was kind of looking in the mirror and he's going, oh, we use these mirrors all the time. We use them as sort of tools like this. Again, mirrors aren't really natural things. They don't really occur in the environment. What would happen if I hung up mirrors in the animals' cages? I have all of these animals in a research context. There's nothing unethical about hanging up mirrors. What would happen if I hang up mirrors? Very simple, simple question um, that led to a very profound methodology um, that's been now used widely. So he did this in sort of two steps. Here's step one. He just wanted to address that question. What happens? Okay, so um, he waited till an animal was being taken out of its cage for some reason, and they are on a regular basis for cleaning the cages or whatnot. And then he hung up mirrors where the animal could see. And he reintroduced the animal to their cage, um, which means the animal saw themselves, their reflection in the mirror for the first time. What'd they do? Well, depends on the animal. Um, there's a first step that every animal went through. When they first saw their reflection, they reacted to it however they would react to a new member of their species. So some animals react sort of aggressively if you put in a new member of their species into their space. Uh, and so those, those animals might be sort of aggressive towards their reflection. So often dogs, when they first see their reflection the first time, they will bark at it and they will treat it like another dog. So they might literally have a sort of you know, reaction of that sort. Um, other animals are, are very nice, by the way. You can online, you can um, find an example of an orca, a killer whale, where they put a great big mirror in the water. This orca sees its own reflection. It goes away and it gets a fish. I guess, hunts a fish, grabs it, and brings it back, offering it to the reflection in the mirror. That's pretty cool. Apparently, that's what killer whales do when they meet a new killer whale. They give them a fish, kind of like, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Here's a bottle of wine, neighbor. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. But whatever that animal does, that's how they first react. You've seen some. I had a video uh, previously about animals encountering their reflection for the first time in the mirror, and you've seen some of those reactions. You can see more of those on YouTube uh, if you look for animals encountering their reflection uh, in a mirror. Okay, this is step one. Some animals never get beyond step one. That's how they always react to the reflection. But some animals go to stage two. Dogs are examples here. Dogs typically will first react to that as though it's another dog. But after a while of seeing the reflection, they, they start to learn. I say here it has no information value. This is what I mean by that. Animals get very sensitive to things that predict stuff in their environment, predict good things or bad things, right? We'll, we'll talk about this a lot in the learning chapter next. They're, they get really good at learning what's the significance of that stimulus. But if there's some stimulus that doesn't predict anything good and doesn't predict anything bad, especially a stimulus that doesn't really smell like anything, um, which is true of a reflection in a mirror. You know, it has a look, it looks like a reflection, but that's all it has. It doesn't have any other attribute that a real thing would have. And, and very quickly, dogs seem to learn that's irrelevant. Just because that reflection is there, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't tell me anything about what's going to happen in the world, in the environment, and they start to just ignore it. Uh, we will call this habituation in the next chapter when you start to when you ignore stimuli that don't predict anything in your environment. Uh, but that's what the dogs do. And that's typically as far as they go. Okay, they will not reach stage three that I'll tell you about. So some animals just get to that point. They just ignore their reflection. It's like it doesn't exist. In fact, it can be hard to make them look at the reflection. Um, uh, that's, that's true with my dog. She didn't, if I try to make her look in the mirror, she just looks everywhere else. If I hold her up in front of a mirror, it, she's, she seems completely unimpressed with her own reflection. Strange. A few animals though, and the, and the, and the prize for Gallup was chimpanzees. They make it to stage three. Um, and these animals, after ignoring the mirror for a while, start to re-engage with the mirror, but differently. It's like something has happened 
they've they've had a, an, a realization of a sort um, and they start to use the mirror so the chimpanzees started to do if, if you were my mirror the chimpanzees started to do things like this sorry I hope my mouth was clean <laughs> but they look inside their mouth a place they normally can't see and I won't do that I'll spare you of this but they also would turn around and check out their butt Come on, you've done it. Don't tell me you haven't. Um, so, so they would use the mirror as a tool for self-inspection. This blew Gallup's mind. Okay, when he saw the chimpanzees doing it first, and then he actually got some other monkeys as well, uh, and they hit this stage as well. When he saw them using the mirror like a tool, he said they are using that as a tool to inspect themselves which I think means they have a sense of self. So he kind of thought about this and notice this is very informal, right? And he just hung up mirrors and watched. So he wanted to come up with a much more formal uh, experiment-like approach, a methodology that other people could replicate uh, in, in different places. And so that gave birth to the uh, mirror test, or it's sometimes called, sorry, that should be called, that should be or, um, or the rouge test of self-awareness. Um, and, and I'll explain to you why it goes by those two names. It's touching rouge in a mirror, so you'll see. But this, this was the formalization. So he did the following. He would first of all take whatever animal was of interest and he would let them um, have, a, have a mirror for a while and let them reach whatever stage they could reach in the previous way. All right, so let's imagine a chimpanzee because that was the real star of, of that. So a chimpanzee goes through that. Now, uh, at some point, when this chimpanzee is anesthetized and, and you have to do this every now and then, especially to do dental work on them or other things, chimpanzees are actually very strong, very powerful animals. You don't want to muck with them. Um, and so if you have to do something they're not going to like, like dental work, you anesthetize them. And so while they were anesthetized, what he did was place rouge, red marks, um, on one of their earlobes and one of their eye, eyebrows. He was very careful to make sure that the, the stuff they used for these marks were odorless and tactile-less, so they didn't feel like anything. They didn't cause any itch or anything like that. So there's every reason to believe that when the animal wakes up, they can't see these parts of them, so they wouldn't know it's there, right? And so now you bring the animal back to the cage, you let it recover from the surgery, um, and sure enough, during this recovery period, the animal isn't doing anything particular to their face. Okay, now at a critical point, when they're recovered, they're back to their, their normal sort of selves, you let them see themselves in the mirror again. You would have covered it until this time. You show them the reflection. What do they do? Well, what they do is the following. They look at the mirror and then they do this. And they do this. And specifically, you can count how often do they touch these two compared to how often do they touch these two. So these two become like a control. These are like the experimental thing. And so you can literally say, how often do they touch the places we marked versus the ones we didn't mark? And what you see is they touch these a lot. They are looking in the mirror and kind of doing this and doing this. And what Gordon Gallup says is, they think there are marks on their face and they are trying to figure out why there are marks on their face. And in order to think you have a mark on your face, you must have a conception of you. For a chimp to say, I have a mark on my face, it needs to possess self-awareness, a sense of its own being, uh, a sense of its own existence as an, as an individual entity. Okay, bring you back to the graduate class, Waterloo. He kind of walks us through this and he shows us a bunch of video. And in fact, I'm going to put some videos below this um, front that I'll get from YouTube of, of animals going through the, the mirror test. So you have a sense. Or maybe I'll put one of, of some children going through the rouge test. They usually call it rouge test with humans, mirror test with animals. It involves rouge and a mirror. So take your choice. Um, but he, he showed us um, a bunch of the data. And he showed us a bunch of videos and this whole room full of students that were ready to just rip him apart sat there quietly. 
and and I, and I was like, wow, these animals have self awareness. That's pretty freaking powerful. I mean, I always knew they might, but it sure seems like they do. Okay, we didn't have a lot to to fight back. We left that largely believers. Um, now, it turns out, and I, and I want to give you this sense of science, that not everybody was a believer. So there was one very well-known critic, a guy named Daniel Povinelli. Uh, and Povinelli's alternate explanation went as follows. And, and I think this is really good because this gives you a sense of how science progresses. He's like, okay, yes, they are touching those parts of themselves, but... Monkeys have what he said, a very strong kinesthetic awareness, monkeys and apes. They, they know a lot about their body and how to control it. They have to because they swing around in trees and stuff. And if you get things wrong when you're swinging around at altitude, well, you can die. You can fall a great, uh, great length and that's, that's enough to kill you. Uh, and so he said they're very aware of their bodies and where their bodies are. What, what, what lobe of the brain would that be, by the way? Varietal. Excellent. Okay. Um, so that they have a very developed sense of proprioception, where their body parts are, and how they work. And so he said, okay, so let's start there. And now let me tell you about something else. Let's, let's think about something else, and I'll bring it together. Have you ever played a video game where you have a character in the video game, and you learn that by your controls, the things that you do, you can do certain things and that, and, and that makes the character do certain things. So if you want that character to explore something, you can do certain actions to control that character. All right, so now, here's what Povinelli says could be happening. The chimpanzees see them see a reflection in the mirror. There's a critter in there. It's kind of like the video game. Hey, there's a character. They've learned through time. They can control that character. If they do movements, remember, they have a really good sense of their body. Hey, if I do this, he lifts his arm. And if I do that, he lowers his arm. And I can control that guy totally, almost like a video game, okay? Um, and then one day, they look at that guy in the mirror. He's got marks on his face. Why does he have marks on his face? Well, I can help him figure it out. I can help him touch that mark on his face, because if I do this, he will do the same thing, and that will allow him to touch the mark on the face. And I can do this. And so what Povinelli is saying is they never know that that reflection is them. They're not recognizing themselves. They're seeing it as an entity that they can control. And when the marks are there, then they use that control to help that entity explore the marks. It's a subtle variation, but it, of course takes out the idea of self-awareness, right? And implies they could do this without self-awareness, which was the critical um, thing that, that Gordon Gallup wanted to conclude. This is critical thinking. You know, this is somebody thinking right through this and saying, can I come up with an alternate explanation? The next step then, of course, is to try to test that alternate explanation. But Povinelli never really got that far because a lot of his description was very much focused on chimpanzees. And... Um, subsequent to Gallup's original work, which was 1970, by the way, to put it in a little bit of context, people started coming up with variants of the mirror test that they could use on all kinds of different animals, um, a whole bunch of them. And suddenly we saw a bunch of animals passing the mirror test. So first of all, it's not clear what it means when an animal doesn't pass. Like a dog, for example, seems not to recognize itself in the mirror. It doesn't even look at the mirror. Does that mean a dog has no self-awareness? Well, maybe, or maybe a dog isn't very visually oriented. They're much more smell. They're not impressed by something that looks like them because they don't care too much about what things look like anyway, you know, maybe. So it's hard to know what failing the test means. But when an animal passes the test, that's when it feels like self-awareness is there. Now, Povinelli had an explanation for chimpanzees. But people started doing this with all sorts of animals. And let me very quickly pop out of here. Sorry, I should have had this all directly ready to go. And goodness knows where, where would I want will be here. Um, nope. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. You guys are going to get to see everything uh, <laughs> that I have open here while I try like heck to find. Okay, I'm just going to go real quick. Uh, I know what that is. 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 No, no. 
Det skal vi ind. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, goodness. What is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's not it. That's PayPal. Oh, my goodness. Oh, come on. Surely I didn't close it. No, oh, still gotta go to that. Oh, yeah, there's everybody video. Oh, Google Drive. Oh. I will get to this. I swear I'll get to this. My goodness, where did it go? Oh, video again. Sorry, it's important. Ah, oh, crud balls. Crud balls. That makes no sense to me. I just opened this for you. Oh, well, well let's just let's just take a freaking heck. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Apologies for my uh, scrambling around, but hey, why not? See the profits, human. Okay. Let me close all these. Oh yeah, I'm late for a meeting. Almost. Okay. Look at some of these animals that have passed the mirror test. Elephants, um, Asian elephants, bunch of great apes, bottlenose dolphins, orcas, whales, uh, Eurasian magpies, ants, manta rays, maybe. <laughs> so what's the point? The point here is that octopus pass as well, by the way, that all of these animals, including things like ants, seem to be able to pass tests of self-recognition. Human children cannot pass this test until they're about 18 to 24 months old. Before that, they react to the, the reflection as though it's another child, stage one, right? Um, but once they get to about one and a half or two, then they start to recognize that it's them. And then shortly after that, they can't see themselves enough. <laughs> At some point, they fall in love with the mirror. Uh, but it takes a while for humans to be able to pass this test. So does this mean that many animals are self-aware? And does it also mean that self-awareness takes time to develop in humans? We think so. Um, and of course, you know, from my perspective, you know, I, I like to throw out that charge. Like, you know, why is it okay to do things to animals in research that we wouldn't do to humans? Well, one of the answers to that, almost back to Descartes, was that humans have a, a soul. Well, psychology doesn't do a whole lot of soul, but self-awareness have a sense of themselves. So some people thought animals don't really have a sense of their own existence. And so you can do nasty things to them because they don't really understand um, you know, the, the whole situation. But if they have a sense of their own self, their own existence, Maybe that's not different. At least some animals seem to have self-awareness. And so that started my mind going like, well, what's the difference then? Why are we, why can we do these things to humans? Cool, cool. All right. So yes, as suggested, I will put some links below um, that will connect you to a couple of YouTube demonstrations of the mirror test and the rouge test. Um, and just a good place for you to think about, you know, how does this all relate to consciousness, the sense of self? So a self is one of the things we can become aware of and think about who we are. Um, but also I wanted to bring in again that idea of doing experiments on complex topics and uh, the challenge of psychology. But but the, the challenge that can be met if you're clever enough and you come up with neat ways of getting at things. Uh, and I think nothing demonstrates that better than Gordon Gallup. I also, of course, hope I messed up with your heads a little bit because that's always part of what I try to do. Alrighty, I'm going to leave it there. Catch you later, guys. Bye-bye.